Why is David wrong? I guess we'll start there. Well, I think it's the prescription that's wrong. There's a lot in the analysis that I think is good. You know, a lot of the diagnosis is good. A lot of his complaints make sense. But the prescription is completely otherworldly. You know, he wants to go back on the gold standard. He wants to dismantle the federal government. It's like a fully comprehensive reinvention of the American system of government. And I think, you know, he knows that that is impossible. He knows it isn't going to happen. And so he sort of deliberately put himself out of the debate about what we should actually be doing. David, we got to give you a shot to respond to that. Okay, well, I spent a lot of time, 700 pages, going through 80 years of history to show where we've made mistakes over time and where we did good. By the way, the 1950s and 60s, I thought, were a golden era of fiscal rectitude and, and sound money under Eisenhower and William McChesney Martin. I thought that uh, Carter Glass, who was the father of the Fed, designed it, had the right idea in mind, a banker's bank that did nothing except supply liquidity at the budget kind of rules. But since the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, including the great deficits of the Reagan era, we've gotten off track, and then we got Greenspan and Bernanke, and they've turned the Fed into a bubble machine. And now we've had serial bubbles, and we're stuck in this monstrous system that uh, begets, uh, it's like the Old Testament, one bad thing begets another. So I laid out a few prescriptions at the end that were designed to be deliver deliberately provocative and radical as a kind of standard of measure of what might work in some ideal world and how far away we are today and why I wrote the thing for the Times, Sunday Times last week called Sundown America because I don't think this doomsday machine called the budget or this bubble machine called the Fed can be stopped and it's going to hit a wall and lead to some very bad things. But in your Times piece you also have timing in there with how you think it's going to play out in the market and when and what stood out to me was when we've spoken to market leaders like a Stan Druckenmiller who talks about generational theft who thinks we're in for a very rough road ahead he's very careful and deliberate as other market insiders have been not to give any timing and you're saying in the next couple of years things are going down why do you believe that well because I think now this bubble has become so preposterous the banks of the world all the central banks are part of a convoy of bubble machines look at the Bank of Japan over the weekend announcing 75 billion of purchases a month not just government bonds they're going to buy ETF stock they're going to buy anything they get their hands on but remember Japan is one-third our size so if you put it in our scale over two years doing that month after month is the equivalent of Bernanke saying I'm going to buy five trillion I'm going to expand my balance sheet by five trillion. This is bonkers. This is John Law South Sea bubble stuff <laughs> from the 18th century. That's where the Bank of Japan is, and it's bringing everybody else into a great currency war. And the reason I think we're nearing the end of this is the head of the IMF, which is supposed to be, you know, the voice of discipline and rectitude, said, "Hey, that's great. Run your printing press in Japan so fast. That's what she said. That the thing will probably melt down uh, before the two years are over." A currency. A war is coming, a race to the bottom is coming, insanity has infected all the central banks of the world, and if you think, uh, don't worry about my prescriptions, worry about what's happening right now in all of these different venues. But D David, if I can just jump in here, how, ca how can you say that, don't worry about my prescriptions? I mean, that, that's the problem, right? What do we do about this? No one denies that, you know, the economy is struggling. Nobody denies that mistakes were made when we got into this situation. But how can you sit there and say, don't worry about my prescriptions? Why should we be even interested in what you have to say? if you don't have serious prescriptions. Because Einstein said the measure of insanity is if you keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. The Fed, you can't even talk to them. Zero interest rates for six years, that's what they're proposing. At least stop that. If you don't want to go all the way to my banker's bank and shut down the open market committee, which you should, and get out of the government bond market and just provide liquidity on a standby basis, at least allow interest rates to work. How can you have capitalism if there's no price of money, if there's no price of debt?
Do you think Ben Bernanke is taking an unjustified victory lap, patting himself on the back when you look at the S&P and the Dow? Because for investors, they're having a beautiful run here. But if you actually look at how Americans are being affected, they're in a terrible state. We were at this same point exactly 4,750 days ago. March 2000, the S&P was within a hair, the 500, of where it is today. And if someone is taking a victory lap for creating the same bubble the third time in a row, with the same kind of crazy speculation bubbling up already, then they have no clue what they're doing. Bernanke is a very dangerous man. Clive. Look, this is ridiculous, but Bernanke, I mean, the idea that Bernanke is taking a victory lap is, is nonsense. I mean, Bernanke, like, like other central bankers, they're worried. Of course they're worried about the situation. They're trying to do their best under difficult circumstances. And um, uh, sir, it's just you're not the good voice enough, of I the think, status to... quo. And I ask, how well is that working out when if you measured the unemployment rate, honestly, it's 13 percent if we had the same uh, participation rate we had in 2000. So but three David, bubbles. it's a, a, a striking feature of your book is that we don't need to worry about unemployment. You see uh, unemployment as one of the remedies for the situation. You say in your book if unemployment rises, that will drive wages that down and price people back into work. When did that last happen? Uh, that's what I'm saying, but I'm saying also to you that all of this massive balance sheet expansion, money creating, which does nothing but stay in Wall Street and reward speculators, is doing nothing for the real economy. Nothing for the real economy. So why do we keep doing the same thing? That's all I'm saying. Well, it's better than the alternative, in my view, and frankly, you haven't even offered a plausible alternative. I've I got a very you, good alternative. You even what I've got a very good alternative. Fire okay. the open market committee, get all these money printers off of there, find a Volcker somewhere who's going to say, look it, we're going to sober up, discipline is coming, we're going to let the market breathe and have some interest rates. If they go up a couple of points, so be it, because you can't have capitalism, you can't have financial markets with all these front runners and speculators making a killing uh, for, for no good reason except to uh, create another huge risk. Clive, I want to lead with with you and continue our conversation. I believe before break, you wanted to respond to Mr. Stockman. Yeah, what I want to say really is, is this. I want the old David Stockman back. I was in D.C. in the early 1980s covering Washington politics back then, and I was a huge David Stockman fan. When he was OMB, you know, he developed his reputation for speaking truth to power, talking straight, and he was in the policy mainstream making a difference. And I think that's where David Stockman should be. The problem with this book is that the prescriptions are so outlandish, so utopian, that he's put himself deliberately outside the mainstream of discussion about what we need to do to get the economy back on track. It's as though he's excusing himself from taking part in that serious discussion. So Go back on the gold no standard, dismantle the federal <laughs> government. I mean, this is not going to happen, and he knows it's not going to happen. No, but the point is the mainstream that I may or may not have been a part of in 1981 is so far off in the ditch that my whole analysis of the errors, in my view, of Nixon when he went to Camp David and crashed down uh, Bretton Woods, fixed exchange rates, financial discipline, Reagan when uh, we started on a path of fiscal uh, solvency and responsibility and shrinking the government went in the opposite way, then Greenspan, who allegedly was a gold bug when they put him in, and he ended up being a serial bubble creator, and then Bernanke they put in, who basically said, if necessary, I'll drop money out of a helicopter, and he said that before he even went in. So I say the mainstream has drifted so far over the deep end that my whole analysis, the 700 pages, is uh, you know, out of the mainstream. And so the prescriptions, which are, you know, a half a dozen pages, are in the same place. But the real debate in this country is, has all of this new permanent Keynesianism, and it's ironic with the death of Margaret Thatcher today announced, that we thought in 1981 at least Thatcher and Reagan had killed the Keynesian mythology that we could borrow our way to prosperity once and for all, that by having the government borrow money and passing it out to people so that they'll buy more flat screen TVs was a good thing. All that was dead. Here we are 30 years later, and we're back to the same old thing on steroids, and not only in the fiscal authorities, but in the central 
banks. All the central banks are pure Keynesian, well, well, uh, you know, propositions. Then, then do you believe QE infinity is going to lead to just runaway inflation? No, it's going to lead to an ultimate collapse in the bond market because if you believe the bond vigilantes are dead, then you're delusional. The bond vigilantes are laughing all the way to the bank because they're putting on the ARB, buying the 10-year, let's say it's yielding whatever it is this morning, 1.7, and they're borrowing overnight money on the repo at 10 basis points, capturing the spread, and sleeping like a baby because they know that Uncle Ben said the overnight rate is zero, will be to 215, and I'm going to be buying 85 billion a month in the long-term market, and thereby keeping the price up. Now, this is dangerous because the minute the ARBs realize the Fed is going to stop or slow down or hint or even imply something, and they begin unwinding that trade, the selling crescendo, the selling avalanche will be monumental. They have no clue of how they're going to stop the selling once it starts. It, Clive, is that part of, the, or at least one of the parts of David's analysis that you do agree with? I think there's something in it. I mean, I think he's exaggerating. He seems pathologically prone to exaggeration these days. But there's, there's a germ of truth for sure in what he's saying. You know, we all know that the exit strategy issue is, is a daunting one for the Fed. And w with interest rates this low, you bet people are making mistakes, people are making investments they shouldn't be making. And unwinding all this is not going to be straightforward. But the question is, what is the alternative? I mean, Bernanke is right, in my view, to provide monetary stimulus, to help the economy recover, to support demand. David would call that reckless Keynesianism. I think it's sensible macro policy. One of the things David says in his book is he's against macro management in principle. He doesn't want any countercyclical policy, whatever. I find that very hard to take seriously. Well, well they, let me respond to that because I think 40, 50 years shows that macro management is the equivalent of a narcotic. It gives the economy a good high for a while initially, but it then becomes politically habit forming. Is the it the economy or the market? No, it's both. The, the Congress cannot stop stimulating the economy because there's always some Keynesian economists will say it's a little too cool or it's slowing down or it's speeding up, but don't stop now. And the Fed well, gets they're stopping it. right now. They're stopping right now. The fiscal stimulus is is being withdrawn, and in my view, it's being withdrawn too soon. Well, I mean, if you believe that you can just borrow your way to prosperity, borrow, bury the next generation in debt, well, of course, that's what we're doing. And the thing about bubbles, nobody, you know, we're in the world of the bubble blind. And I would say my opponent here this morning is one of the bubble blind. And you know, the, these are the arguments that. <laughs> have because frankly in 207 I heard it we're in the Goldilocks economy everything's fine Ben was trained That's by true. Ben, ben was trained by Greenspan and so therefore we can count on Ben they had no clue the freight trains coming down the track he didn't see subprime he didn't see the housing collapse they couldn't even tell that housing prices had gone up 200 percent from 95 to 208 and they couldn't see a housing bubble now if you think people who believe all of this uh, are giving you good advice now or that this needs to continue, uh, that's fine. I don't believe it. Clive, I can feel your pain. You <laughs> want David to say something that perhaps might influence uh, policymakers in Washington to do something other than, you know, the utopian prescriptions that, that you say he's offered. What do you suggest? Well, I think on the macro side, I think uh, Bernanke is doing what he has to do. I think uh, he needs to uh, keep the stance of monetary policy easy in order to support demand. I would have uh, a less, uh, far less fiscal contraction in the short term and far stronger fiscal consolidation in the medium to longer term. Uh, that, that's the dual fiscal strategy that I think we need. Um, but just let me say, I mean, I do want to agree with a couple of the things that uh, David's put, it, put his finger on. I mean. Lots of mistakes were made getting us into this crash, and mistakes are being made now. We need safer banks above all, and we need a more responsible long-term fiscal policy. On both of those things, I agree with him. But if we did what David is suggesting right now, forget the gold standard stuff, what he's suggesting right now, which is no more QE, raise interest rates. If I understand him correctly, he wants to raise interest rates right now and balance the budget immediately. If we did that, demand would collapse and we'd have unemployment well into double digits. 
Now, David might think that's fine because it will be a cleansing experience, but I think it will be a social and economic disaster. Well, uh, I've been misunderstood. I don't want to raise interest rates. Oh, I want to. Okay. I want to have interest rates. Ah. Okay. We don't have interest rates. This is just a price manipulated, pegged, uh, imposed on the market by the Fed. There's no supply and demand. The market clears nothing. The financial market is dead. This is entirely a machine running around the Fed, basically trading what the great 12-member uh, monetary politburo is doing. So let's just get back to interest rates and let's stop creating but, credit at this massive rate because it only stays in Wall Street. It, I, I will point out that when the Fed uh, panicked in the fall of 2008 and cut the interest rates to nothing, credit didn't expand in our economy because people were waterlogged with debt anyway. For the next nine months, there was a decline in mortgage lending, there was a decline in business and in credit card debt, and there should have been. Okay, we don't need new debt. We got too damn much debt already, to be honest, and therefore low interest rates won't hurt anything.